many of you have mentioned it. We, we, for the first time in history, we have over 50% urbanization. That is a lot. It means almost 3.8 billion, so almost 4 billion people living in cities. That means we live in a grid like this. And, and this. Now, the bubbles don't seem big, but they, they have a lot of people. Each one of these is a mega city. A mega city is a city over 10 million people. So we have 28 mega cities right now, and it's expanding very fast. So we have 16 of them in Asia, four in Latin America, three in Europe, three in, a in Africa, and two in North America. So I think the center of gravity is really moving east. Just, just by the weight of the people alone. And in China, almost 60, like 56 United States, we have nine. <laughs> we have to squash our very iconic building in order to fit in. Cars, you may be wondering, we have 275 million cars in the U.S. How many people do we have in the U.S.? Do you know? Yeah, not that many, more than the number of cars. We love cars. Worldwide, we have 1.2 billion cars. Now, these numbers matter because I'm not going to give you a lecture. I'm going to push you to think. So later on, we'll do a back of envelope calculation. That's what we'll be doing together. Parking garages, you'll be surprised, 31% of the urban square footage is used for parking in your house, in your work, and where you play. So parking garages are actually a lot more than the number of cars. We have 500 million parking spaces in the US alone. And each car only takes 1.08 person. I know the 08 person is very small. So it's one big person plus a little bit of a person. That happens all the time. In fact, I have many jokes I can tell you afterwards. So, let's look at how safe it is for us to drive ourselves. 38,000 people, over 38,000 people got killed in the US alone just last year. Worldwide, more than 1.25 um, million people. That means seven Boeing 747 drop from the sky every day. If that happens, would you not say, oh my God, we have to change something? But we don't. We just still have so many people die every year. And why do they die? So this is for you. What percentage of automobile accidents are caused by human error? You have to be fast, come on. Exactly, it's actually 94%, but I thought four doesn't sound very good for the Chinese. So I make it 95. 94%. That is very scary because they're putting on makeup, they're eating cereal. If you have watched Mr. Bean, you will know what one does in the car. And they're texting, they're doing all kinds of things. That's not acceptable. And then 96% of the time, your car is not doing anything. Not doing anything. Now, let's, let's think of it the other way. If you have a company, your employee works only 4% of the time. Are you okay with that? You won't be, right? Because then it's a hobby, it's not a business. And yet, your car sits doing nothing 96% of the time. So now I want to talk about autonomous, autonomous vehicle. This one just happened to look like that, but autonomous vehicle can, can be in the sky as well, and I will talk about that too. So this little thing, have you seen one? Have you been in one before? Okay, so this little thing has how many miles on the road? Fast? How many? Two million! Excellent! Excellent! You get a gift later. Two million miles and you have not seen it before. It has been very, very safe for two million miles. It did, there are 48 of them, of these robot cars running around. And they have had accidents but they were caused not by the car, not by this one. It's by the humans, by us, hitting it. There are people, when they see this in Silicon Valley, they jump in front of it. They want to test it with all kinds of funny things. Some even have a, 
if you, if you Google, you will see Google car, you know, Google, Google car. You will see they have videos of ducks walking in front of them. They test this car with all kinds of things, not by Google, tested by people like us. So this car, another view of it, it's quite incredible because I think it would disrupt our future more than we know. Now, which country had the first driverless taxi or share ride? D, Singapore. D, Singapore. You're not supposed to answer the question. You just came back from Singapore. <laughs> but a lot of people would have thought England, United States, Japan, this very, very forward-thinking country, Finland, Singapore. Now, Singapore is very forward-thinking. I know that, but they really were racing to be first before Pittsburgh, before Uber was doing the test. They did it a month before. So Singapore. And the, a 2014 study by MIT and Stanford estimated that Singapore could replace the entire fleet of passenger vehicles with one third as many if they use Mo mobility, now look at that, mobility on demand. That means you don't have your own driverless car sitting in your garage doing nothing for 98% of the time. It's a shared economy. When that happens, they only need one third of the cars. Now imagine what would cities look like if we have only one third of the cars. Uber, they're testing, just to show you, is a lot of equipment. And the pricing of this equipment with um, Moore's laws, are coming down substantially. With the leader system, the, the, uh, the LIDAR, the radar, there's light sensing, it does all kinds of things. Not that long ago, maybe two, three years ago, that might have cost $80,000 for that piece of equipment. Now it's $6,000. So very soon, each one of our cars can be using that. Let's look at the diverse opinions. California says, well, soon the cars will be without steering wheels. Yeah, <laughs> that's not the big deal. So driverless cars can kill the most jobs in select US states. And I will show you a little bit of that because it's a major concern. Driverless cars, 70% of Americans said they're game to try one. So it sounds like Disneyland. The Economist actually said forget driverless cars because in the future we will have driverless air taxis and, and uh, helicopters. This diagram, this, this, well, this figure, you know when you're doing a PhD you have a lot of figures that you have to deal with. So when you're looking at the very, very dark maroon red areas, those are the areas with the most concentration of people earning their living with driving. This is quite serious because you're talking about seven to nine percent of your economy, of your gross domestic product per city, that is related to driving. What would these people do? So it's something that one has to think about. And, and because of that, you can imagine, just with Donald Trump and with Hillary, we have so many debates. Like this will be even more so. So ET, well, ET is to talk about the innovation. So let's look at how many airports do you think Uber already drive to? Sorry? 500, that will be next year. 400, that's a lot. 400 airports they already go to. Because of that, it's not such a far-fetched idea to think that driverless car will interrupt the airports and airlines, and we will do that soon. So the runway. What do you think is driverless car's major revenue impact to airports and airlines? Parking garages? Yes. Anything else? Just in time? Rental car? How about the airlines? They are not in moon, okay, so we'll go there. Back of the envelope calculation. Kurt has a habit of drawing his design on the back of envelopes. So I have mentioned to our assistant, I said, please keep those envelopes because they will be, they will be worth some money later. So, so I want you to think about the back of the envelope thinking, okay? 
I don't want to go into details because it's crazy, because then we can discuss the margin of error and all kinds of things. Don't do that. Just look at big magnitude, what that means. This is a beautiful airport, and we, I, I live there, actually, because I have to go there almost every two days. This is incredible. But it has a very ugly sister. And the ugly sister <laughs> that we normally don't show people is 40,000 40, parking spaces. That is a lot. 40,000. What it means is we have 50 million flying through, and most of them don't even land. I think we may have 55% uh, transit passengers. And yet we have 40,000 cars. 14,000 of them are in the, in the structured parking. 10,000 are in the service parking, and then you have off-airport parking. So I'll show you some more. This is the epicenter of our car culture. Do you recognize what this intersection is? It's very famous. It's the intersection, intersection of lost. When you drive in LA, you're driving along freeway 10, suddenly you're on freeway 5. It's like, what just happened? It's because there's so many freeway exchanges that happen all the time. So this is 110 and 10 intersection. And it's a perpetual parking lot. This is LAX. We did the newest terminal, the international terminal. But why I want to show you this is because, let me try this now. Uh, parking, parking, parking. Uh, parking in the middle, except the spider building. It's all parking. And it's here as well. And then, most of the parking is on the column outside. You don't see. It's not even in this frame. It really takes up a lot of space. It really is not necessary. And it will save life if we don't have so many parking, if autonomous cars will be our driver. Because it's not just for us. When you're looking at the demographics, your child, you don't have to be picking up Lucy to take, go to piano lesson and then go to ballet lesson. Lucy can get a, a driverless car that you ordered and it will only open the door for Lucy, take Lucy from place to place, and she's four years old. And then the driverless car, a different one, will take your mother shopping, because your mother is now 85, and she doesn't, you don't want her to drive, actually. She still wants to drive. <laughs> and, and so it has a lot of purposes that are beyond, beyond what we're thinking about. This is parking lot C of LAX, and it's constantly full. And this is San Marco. When you arrived here, unless you walk or swam, this would have been, ah, oh, and the train, this would have been your first welcome experience. So you have your terminal here, which is tiny. I don't mean, I don't mean the terminal is tiny, but in relationship to all the parking, this is parking, 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 parking. And this is a city that doesn't drive. So, <laughs> it tells you it's an issue. <laughs> so, let's look at the back of the envelope. So, so, you take out the back of the envelope in your head, okay? Airport parking revenue. So, yesterday, Ashok was talking about 20% of the non-aeronautical avenues is airport parking, and that does not even include car rental. And that's U.S. In internationally, it's about... 8 to 10% of the total revenue, because you have to add the aeronautical revenue as well. 8 to 10% of the revenue in 2015, do you know roughly how much that is? No idea, no clue, that's okay. So, so I won't give you the answer since you have no clue. So, <laughs> uh, that's worldwide. US is 10%, worldwide is about 8 to 9%. So that's why I put 8 to 10 percent. It's very safe. So this was Hong Kong, my birthplace. And when a flight, now, I did not give you the answer for airport. So we'll come to that if, if you want to know. Now look, let's look at airlines. You have a driverless car. When you go to an airport, you have to be stripping half of your clothes. You have to be lugging all kinds of things. Just, just the, you know the drive through airport you were just talking about? Excellent. So I still have 25 minutes. So, <laughs> so, so when, when 
the last speaker was talking about the drive-through airport, talked about short-haul flights, and it's so true when you have short-haul flights. Why would I want to spend five hours for one-hour flight? Why do I want to go downstairs, get into a transportation of some kind, go over there, be stripped, and or have my skirt blown onto my face, and then board the plane and wait for a long time, do a lot of shopping. Wait for a long time and then the, the same procedure happens on the other side. Oh, by the way, airport people always talked about processing the passengers. I just want you to know we're not sausages. <laughs> Please don't process the passengers. Find a better term. So this is Hong Kong. And when a plane land and when they taxi, they have the most fuel burn. And so they are the most polluted, the noisiest, and so on, is during this time. And this is, as you can tell, not, not that much above people's heads. And so the more we can avoid short-haul flights, the better it is. That's why the competition in demand and supply will be trains, cars, you drive yourself, or your bike, you bike for a long time, or you do your driverless cars. That's why we'll do our back of envelope calculation. Now, why is this slide there? It has no purpose. I just love it. I love the movie Fifth Element. I love to live in the world where Bruce Willis will come to my noodle shop and just be on a hovering car and eating noodles. So I really think that it will come. And speeding will still be an issue. So the back of the envelope calculation, let's look at 2008, airline revenue. In one year, the whole industry lost $26 billion in one year. And when you look at deregulation that happened in the US in 1979, between 79 and 89, as you can see here, the industry lost $54 billion. So they, they lost less than 2008 but th that's still a lot of money. And then the next 10 years, they, they make some money. In 10 years, the whole industry make five billion. And then they lost another 54 billion. So 54 has a, and you will see 54 again. So 2015 was a very good year for the airline industry. So of all the airlines together, around the whole world, they made 35 billion dollars. That was the highest ever in history. And their revenue was 720 billion dollars. I want you to look at the bottom of the envelope. It's a fruit company called Apple. Apple last year, 2015, made the most money also, just like the airlines. They only make 234 billion in a year in revenue. But the profit was 53 billion dollars. So just to know the relationship, okay? So Apple, one company, makes more money in one quarter than the, the airline as a whole. So, so I have 10 minutes. So this is a very low margin business with serious ex external risks. When a volcano erupts, the airlines have to ground. When people fly into buildings, they have to ground. All kinds of things. So this is a very tough business. How can we make it more, more competitive? So the back of the envelope says, OK, if driverless cars can take away 5% of the business, it's a $36 billion business. 10% is a $72 billion. You pick a number. Whatever number you pick has a lot of zeros to it. So let's think about it. In 1880, 1890, that kind of time, we were riding horses and we were going fairly fast. If you have a horse like, what is a famous horse that runs very fast? Secretariat, that's right. If you're the owner of Secretariat, he wasn't born then. But someone like Secretariat, you can maybe go 30, 40 miles per hour for about half an hour. And, and then, they would be thinking, when the automobile came along, they would say, it's not, we don't need a car. We just need a faster horse. And you can see the horse were pulling the, the trolley here. That's 1919. The horses were retiring at that time they, because they, they thought that they were smelly and there was a lot of manure they have to deal with. So what market 
are you really in? Because when the cars came, the trains people said, we're in transportation. But are you in trains business or are you in transportation? So it's this idea of looking at the airlines and airports. What industry, what business are you really in? So I would say we are in, not electricity, but we are in mobility. So, for the company that are very clever, like Uber, Uber define themselves as a mobility company. And this is excellent because I'm ending right here. Airbus. Airbus, I, I know this thing doesn't look so cool, but it's actually a very friendly thing. Airbus has, has already, will be, they have tested it, but it's not so successful, but they will continue to test. So next year, <laughs> that's the idea. You don't want to get into something unsafe in the air. Gravity is against you. So Airbus and Uber already are teaming up to do air taxi. So using your app, when you have a big event like Sundance Festival or like the World Cup, you can actually order a hel helicopter to come pick you up and share a ride. They already are doing it. But next year, Airbus will come up with all kinds of things, such as uh, they call it the A3, Autonomous Flying Vehicle Platform, and they have the City Airbus and Airbus Helicopter. Now, Boeing is, is doing similar things. They just don't, don't brand it as much. So, I just want, want to end with this. This is sort of the virtual reality thing. When you go into your driverless part inside the airport, inside the terminal, that's where I want to go to and where I want to end with. Next time when I go to Frankfurt, airport. I don't want to walk. Last time I walked two and a half miles in order to make my connection. I want to call my little Uber part that will have a share revenue with the airport so that when they lose money through the parking revenue, they make money through share ride. And my part will know me because it has my biometric. I touch the door, it already has my fingerprints. It validates me, said, ah, she's good. Then I can go through immigration without stopping. It takes me to gate E165. And along the way, I can say, oh, let's go pick up some sushi. So that is my world. And meanwhile, I'm inside. I'm doing my virtual reality conference call, and I will see Kurt that way. So thank you.